I said the other day that America ought to be grateful that black folk have sought justice and not revenge. Uh, we are exhausted from living in a system that neglects us. America's identity is founded on systemic racism. We're tired of saying names. We're tired of writing hashtags. In the words of the great prophet Fannie Lou Hamer, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And as they prepare tomorrow to make their final closing arguments in that case, America is already bracing for the worst. They've already begun to board up buildings in Minneapolis. They've already called in the National Guard and extra police force uh, to deal with uh, the potential civil unrest should there be an acquittal in this case. It's amazing how they get so prepared for black folk, uh, amen, to express their grievances. Yet for months they were saying they were going to the Capitol on January 6th. They didn't board up a building. They didn't call on the National Guard. They didn't get any extra police presence. Why? Because they had the complexion for the protection. When the crack epidemic was here, they said we had to get tough on drugs. Just say no. Zero tolerance. And they criminalized both the drug dealer and the drug user, and they used it to mass incarcerate generations of black people. All of a sudden, when opioids, heroin, and, and oxycontin and oxycodone became a problem in America, but the face of the users were white faces, they did not say zero tolerance. They did not say we have to lock them up. Uh, what they said was it's a public health crisis, uh, and the users uh, have uh, a, a a health, uh, have a sickness that needs to be dealt with, and we need to be kind and gentle and put them in programs and give them resources and help them get over their addiction. Uh, uh, and it seems like uh, all of a sudden now uh, uh, the same ones uh, who had looked a kindly, gentler response uh, to opioids uh, when George Floyd had opioids in his system. They went back to, well, he's a criminal anyway. Uh, but what about your mama and them and your children and them and all them white kids out there in the suburbs uh, that are on opioids? Do they deserve to have a police officer put his knee in their neck for nine minutes until he chokes the life out of them? And what happens here in this text, Jesus violates uh, this separation of space by entering into the demonized space uh, of the Samaritans. And that's my first point. Jesus crosses boundaries to reach the marginalized. Uh, Jesus placed himself in the middle of those that were the most denigrated, uh, the most marginalized, uh, the most feared. Uh, he ignored all of the prevailing caricatures uh, about the Samaritan people as unclean and dangerous people. He flagrantly dismissed the social religious narratives about Samaritans by going out of his way to enter into their space and it shows his intentional solidarity with a crucified class of people. Jesus again God incarnate is affirming the, the sacred worth of this woman. That's my second point. Jesus affirms that Black Lives Matter. Jesus frees her from the social religious constructs uh, that deemed her as an offense uh, and restores her sacred identity. Associating with her, he raises her profile. Y'all ain't gonna help me in here. Uh, now watch this. Uh, at the same time, he raises her profile uh, in her community, in his community, they look down upon him for associating with her, so he lowered his profile in the eyes of his community. In other words, he leveled the playing field.
7 WTCC. Good morning. Welcome to the Spoken Word. I'm your host, Bishop Talbot Swan II. And as usual, we'll be telling it like it is through cultural idioms and nuances that shape the order, ethos, and chaos of the African American experience. Words have their own vitality, they shape their own consciousness and create their own context. For interpreting social and spiritual reality, the spoken word contains the power to reshape the landscape of society. It is six minutes. Six minutes, Dougie Fresh, you're on. No, six minutes past the hour of 9 a.m. I want to thank Mr. Kenneth Barnett for bringing us up until the 9 o'clock hour with the promise and you can hear the promise every Monday morning from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Bringing you the best in gospel music. Good way to start out your Monday morning. Great way to start out your week. Um, and man, it's been a beautiful week. Weather-wise, we've had um, some hot weather here. It was 93 degrees yesterday and it's going to be hot again today. And so summertime is in the house. Um, listen, today I need to talk about a couple of things. I'm going to briefly talk about um, the, there's a rally at City Hall in Springfield um, on Wednesday at 11 a.m. Uh, sponsored by the Mass Senior Action Council. And they're calling for the removal of uh, Police Commissioner Cheryl Claproot. Now, uh, some of you all will remember that the NAACP, the Pioneer Valley Project, um, City Councilor um, Justin Hurst, um, Tracy Whitfield, and others have already called for her removal from office. Um, this police commissioner is out of control. Um, uh, she's she's a racist. See, and 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 here's the deal. Um, Clap rule went straight grand wizard in a letter to the Mass Senior Action Council. I'll talk about it right after the break and before I bring on my guest. Um, but she went straight grand wizard, um, just completely ignoring the reality of what's happening within this police department. And so we'll talk about that. Uh, also, I'm going to talk about how it is that Asian Americans can get $50 million in grants, $5 billion piece of legislation passed to stop uh, Asian hate, and black folk who have been being lynched and brutalized in America for 400 years can't get an anti-lynching bill passed, can't get the uh, George Floyd Justice in Policing Act passed, and then when President Biden goes down to um, uh, to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, he goes down talking about how interracial couples on commercials uh, bodes well for the black community. And he didn't come down there with a check to the few remaining survivors of the Tulsa Race Massacre. Why is it everybody else can get reparations? Japanese can get reparations. Native Americans get reparations. Even Jewish folk, when the Holocaust didn't even happen here, under the Obama administration, they set aside millions of dollars uh, for Holocaust survivors. But black folk, whose ancestors built this nation off of free and forced labor, 
they always talk about well we got to study reparations so my guest uh today is uh miss teslin uh, figaro uh political consultant uh, founder of Tesla Figaro Communications Group. Um, she's the host of the Straight Shot No Chaser a podcast on iHeartRadio, a political analyst on Fox News, uh, on Black News Channel, etc., etc. She's going to be with me uh, at about 15 minutes past the hour to talk about why black folk can't get no reparations. Okay? Uh, so stay with me. Tell somebody, tell them that the bishop is on the air. You want to be um, a part of this conversation on today. Don't you dare go nowhere. Uh, we're coming right back. Um, coming right back after this. Don't go nowhere. <laughs> Replaying the movie, why did this happen to me? When it's done with you, be done with it. If it seems like you keep running into pigeons, it's an indication that you're flying too low. So set your sights a little higher. Remember, eagles fly by themselves. If you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. Allow your challenges to be a stepping stone to propel you into new powers. So be discontent with your past accomplishment. You're only as great as your last success. So maintain your hunger and your passion. Remember this, within every seed there is a tree, in every tree there is a forest. Doing what you were born into is simply the environment to prepare you for your ultimate purpose. It was not a setback, it was a setup. Your purpose and potential is bigger than your past pain or problem. Much of life is about sacrifice. You gotta give up something to get something. Success is not about what you've accomplished, but it's what you have overcome. For it's the test that you pass in life which qualifies you for the next level. You have to be willing to face your challenges and overcome them. Most people drive 12,000 miles a year moving forward, but most accidents are caused when they move backwards. You gotta stay focused on what's ahead of you instead of what's behind you. It's your daily routine that determines your success or failure. Whatever you practice that is what you become great at. What's more important than being intelligent is having the right attitude. Respect costs you nothing, but it will cost you everything not to have it. So don't too smart for your good. Remember, her head makes a soft behind. What's more important than your five senses is common sense. The heart of a fool is in his mouth, but the heart wise man is in his character. So don't sweat the small things. The answer for a short temper is a long walk. Be slow to speak, quick to listen, and remember this. You haven't lived long enough to know everything. Your character is what matters most. Once you have been labeled with a bad reputation, it's hard for people to see you any other way. A good name is worth more than all the money in the world. Your life is broken up into three parts. First you learn, then you earn, and then you return. You gotta give back.
90.7 WTCC. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome, 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 welcome to the spoken word. So listen, 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 listen. I need y'all at City Hall. Um, I need y'all at City Hall um, on Wednesday, all right, at 11 a.m. Those of you who can, those of you who can, be there on Wednesday. It's important. Let's support the Mass Senior Action Council um, as they call for uh, the removal of this rogue police commissioner. This let's let's just put some perspective on this. This police department is under the scrutiny of the um, Department of Justice for routinely using excessive force against black and brown citizens. Routinely, routinely, routinely. Um, Here's the deal. There's 14 officers under indictment for beating four black men or covering up the crime. There's an officer who was convicted of beating a 15-year-old black boy at Commerce High School. There's uh, an officer who is being prosecuted for threatening a, a Latino kid that he would smash his skull uh, in the parking lot, threatening to murder a so-called suspect. This is a police department that has been called one of the worst in the country, according to the Boston Globe, one of the worst in the country. And this, this, police commissioner has the unmitigated gall, has the audacity to say, um, we're not racist. We don't suffer from systemic racism. This is what she said, y'all. We don't suffer from systemic racism. Um, we're not implicitly biased. I don't exert any kind of privilege. This is the foolery that she's saying to the Mass Senior Action Council. Um, you know, basically, you Negroes are out of your mind. Um, I mean, she just she just goes full blown white supremacist, full blown grand wizard. Um, she said things like that, similar to that, to me in an email last year, literally days before the DOJ report came out. She said, we don't have a problem with police brutality. We have a problem with gangs. Now, this is what she's saying to me. I promise you, literally days before the DOJ report came out. We don't have a problem with, she sent it to me in an email. We don't have a problem with police brutality. We got a problem with black boys and gangs. And then when the DOJ report comes out and they make recommendations on how to mitigate the problem of um, routinely brutalizing black people and brown people, uh, she then uh, comes out with the mayor and says, oh, we're already implementing uh, these changes as we speak. Well, the question I have uh, is a simple question. How is it that five days ago, police brutality didn't exist and it wasn't a problem, but five days later, oh, we're already working on dealing with the police brutality. I mean, she talks with forked tongue out of both sides of her mouth. Um, she's out of control. How in the world can someone who continues to deny that the problems in the department exist be the leader to 
make reforms in the same department. How does that work? Somebody help me understand that. How does that work? How does that person lead the charge in terms of um, mitigating the issues that exist in the department when she continually denies the existence of the problems? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure that one out. And then when we come to the mayor and we say to the mayor, Mr. Mayor, this is the wrong person. This, this, this is the wrong person for this department. You cannot, you cannot have this person lead the charge, lead reforms, and she doesn't think there's a problem in the department. And the mayor, because it was requested by, you know, us, beats his chest and doubles down. She ain't going nowhere. I stand behind her 100%. Why? Why? Because, because you have to save face in front of white voters and prove to them I'm not going to remove her because the Negroes told me to? She's bad for the department. She's bad for your administration. And instead of playing tough guy and doubling down and keeping her on, she's a train wreck. You need to get rid of her. She's going to be the bane of this administration, I promise you. I promise you. And so, again, I sent a letter to the mayor on behalf of the NAACP reiterating our call to remove this police commissioner. I also sent a letter to Judge Roderick Ireland saying, listen, you cannot be a black man lending your good name and credibility to a so-called process of reform that is nothing but smoke and mirrors. He said twice in public forums, I'm not window dressing. That's what you are right now. You're window dressing. Basically, what Dominic Sarno has done is said, okay, according to the DOJ, our department has a problem beating the hell out of black and brown people. I'm going to go get a well-respected black man, hire him as a consultant, and say he's helping us lead the reforms in the department. That's all that is. It's window dressing. Because since that time, since they brought Judge Ireland on, they reinstated five officers that have been prosecuted for perjury and trying to cover up a crime and then face the backlash of the community and had to resuspend them. This has happened since they hired him as a consultant. Okay? Um, since they hired him as a consultant, cop has been caught on video tasing a pregnant woman. Since they hired him as a consultant, a cop has been convicted of beating a black teenager at Commerce High School, and the commissioner has done nothing, has not removed him from his position. Yet, when a Latino officer posted something in support of Black Lives Matter, she got fired. No hearing before the complaint board or nothing. She got fired. This has happened since Ireland has been the hired consultant. Since he's been the hired consultant, she has sat in a public forum and said, there's no systemic racism in this department. While he was on the Zoom, she said this, okay? This is since the black man has been the consultant. Ireland has to either speak up or step down. Period. Good morning, caller. Good morning, Bishop Swan. Great job, sir. I, I just wanted to um to just add on to the what we um some uh, um what we have been talking about is um the window 
addressing, um, and particularly, and this is not Bishop Swan saying that this is Charles Stokes. So I want everybody to be clear. Well, I already that said it. A, <laughs> I, I know you. <laughs> I already said you it. Have, you have people like Helen Carlton Harris. You have people like Milo Brown, uh, good brother LeVar Click. You have all of those people from our community that we love that continue to support this mayor and what he does. And then he throws them at us as a buffer because we have relationships, we love them. And so he puts these blacks, and I don't understand how it's mostly our people who, and if you people like Maria Perez on the school committee, who's a black Latino African, who put that thing together where the public schools now have permission, the police now have permission to monitor our children in public school. It seems like the black and Latino people he puts in office are still, I know they have a job, but they won't speak out. They support him. He puts them on Zoom meetings. They're in our faces. And if we call them out for supporting him, uh, we're called the bad guys. Well, here's the thing, Brother Brother Stokes, here's the thing. I, I, I don't expect. I don't expect anybody who is drawing their livelihood and, and drawing a paycheck from this administration to be outspoken like you and I. I, I. I expect they're going to protect. I mean, they got they got their 401k, their 403bs, all that stuff. Um, they're they're protecting their livelihood, um, and 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 here, the best I can say for them is is to try to be fair in in the exercise of their duties. And not to disingenuously speak in support of stuff that they know is not in the best interest of the black community, and to perhaps work behind the scenes to assist our community. That that's what they can do. Um, and, and yeah. The frustrating thing is the thing that you and I and Pine Valley Project and others have been saying. Right now, our seniors, our aunties. Grandmothers, my mother happened to be on the seniors uh, board commission. They're telling our elders, our loved ones now, who have been here longer than all of us, that what they have seen, and now this mayor, this police commissioner, they are disrespecting our elders by telling our elders yeah, yeah, what yeah. they see are not true, and we as a, as a community should be appalled and out. It's okay if they talk about Charles Stokes. It's okay if they deny Bishop Swan. But when they start telling our elders, our mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and uncles that yeah. what they're seeing is not the truth, mm-hmm. man, it, it, I'm so angry at this guy for disrespecting our elders and no one seems to think that this is appalling. The same elders and here, he and, denied transportation to and here's the and thing here, here, and here's the thing here's the thing so the mayor has been silent on the letter to mass senior action council um and that's a problem because he should have came out and publicly reprimanded the police commissioner for her yeah. comments he should have even if he didn't dismiss her he should have dealt with her in some kind of way he has done nothing but tacitly give approval to her racism to her bigotry and to her incompetence. And that's why it's important that everybody needs to be at City yeah. Hall on Wednesday supporting our seniors and we need to get this rogue police commissioner out of office. Please, out of here. Remember please, this. Go ahead. 2020 is coming. Yeah. 2023 is coming. If this mayor gets reelected, there's going to be a fallback on our on our young people that's growing up coming in this community. We have to have somebody, anybody, viable enough to run against this mayor. We can no longer allow him to be into office. And the black and Latino community, we have to sit down and say, okay, enough is enough. Because just because it's not targeted towards the Latino community, you're just as African as us. Just yeah, that's a that's a whole different conversation, bro. Stokes. I gotta move on for my for my next guest, but 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 I will say this right now. I'm talking about the black community because uh, far too often, and, and I don't mean this in a disparaging way. It just is what it is. Um, 
um, when it comes to the Latino community, uh, and we do have some allies in that community. Unfortunately, um, for the most part, um, they sit in the cut. They sit in the cut and wait and see where the apples are going to fall. And that's not good. All right, let me let me get my guest on here. Let me get my guest on here. Let me see. 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 Yeah. There we go. There we go. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How you doing, I'm doing well. Doing well. I, I, I prefer to see your pretty face than, you know. <laughs> it, it keeps going in and out. I don't know. Oh, I got what's, you. What's, what's going, going on, on with the software? But I'm, I'm okay. still here. The devil is busy. Okay, okay. So I, I kind of get, I gave you all a, a little brief snippet of her bio. Um, a political consultant, founder of uh, Tess and Figaro Communications Group. Um, the host of Straight Shot No Chaser podcast on iHeartRadio, political analyst, Fox News, Black News Channel, a political consultant. She's out there in the trenches um, doing and speaking and um, and all of that kind of stuff. And so I want to welcome uh, Tez and Figaro to the program. Good morning. How you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Oh, I'm fair to Midland. Um, <laughs> you know, trying to make it do what it do. Uh, so listen, I was dealing with some local stuff here uh, with, with our crazy police commissioner who, who we need to get out of office. Uh, but I wanted to talk about um, I wanted to talk about this this issue around reparations, um, the 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 notion that reparations for black people only need to be studied. Um, the fact that every other demographic group um, can get either reparations or get resources but when it comes to black people they can never do anything specifically for black people when mm -hmm. when 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 they when they said that there was an uptick in hate crimes against asian americans and pacific islanders biden's administration quick fast in a hurry set aside 50 million dollars in grants specifically uh, for that community um legislation passed with a five billion dollar price tag to it uh, specifically uh, for Asian Americans. Yet, uh, after 400 years of being lynched, murdered, brutalized, raped, dehumanized, and oppressed in America, uh, we can't get a anti-lynching bill passed. We can't get the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed. And then, as you so eloquently uh, uh, um, brought out, when Joe Biden went down to Tulsa, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, he went down there talking about how black people are better off because interracial um, um, uh, dating is um, highlighted on commercials. And, and then uh, didn't bring a dime with him. You know, so everybody else can get a little something, something, but we can't get nothing. <laughs> what, what's going on? Absolutely. Absolutely, and I, I was listening to you uh, talk to your last guest, and thank you, you know, for pointing that out to him. Um, certainly, respectfully, that this is one of the examples that we're talking about on how every single time it is time to move forward on behalf of Black people in this country, uh, it seems to always uh, go to other groups. You know, they always push the "we're going to lift all boats and all the tides rise" or whatever that saying is, uh, but they seem to forget that that we have a hole in our and mm. we actually built the boat and we didn't ask to come over here on boat. Wow. You see, that's the problem. You know, we keep getting confused on yeah. who owes what. And so on last week, I talked about, you know, the nerve of Joe Biden to go to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oklahoma is my hometown. That's your hometown? I didn't realize that. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm really a Louisiana woman. That's what Figaro is, but I grew up in Oklahoma. And the nerve of him, you know, to go there and not only not even bring a GoFundMe at best, he could at least start a GoFundMe bitch, not, not wait on Congress and it's a GoFundMe at best. But, but not, not even did he did only show up empty-handed, but he also uh, had the audacity to tell people to double down on getting votes in 2022. Right. So that, that, that was really, you know, and, and I know this is a, a Christian show, but... I'm, I'm sure, sure everybody understands the pimp game. 
and, and, and the one thing about the pimp, the pimp is the pimp is, the pimp is always to stop talking and, and start walking. And, and, that's and, and that's what I felt. I felt that it was not an opportunity to uh, do anything for the last three survivors that are living. And, and to kind of say, well, you know, let's not worry about that. Let's just worry about keeping me in office. So the question on reparations which you ask is, if we are not willing to do anything, the government's not willing to do anything for the three living survivors. Because, you know, a lot of the, the, the pushback is, you know, they're no longer living. How do you know who is really, uh, you know, a descendant of a slave and slavery is no longer here? Well, let's just look at the fact that there are three living survivors of the Tulsa Massacre. Mm -hmm. Let's just look at that. We're not, We're not willing to do anything for the three living survivors. Not, not, not only is Congress not willing to do it, Joe Biden's not willing to do it. Us, us out here in the, in the commentator, commentator space are not willing to call it out. It's only a handful of us that's willing to call it out repeatedly. How can I have any hope for a study that says you're going to repair three million plus folks when we won't even do anything for three? Wow. Wow. And and here's the thing. They they often come up with these questions. First of all, um, like you said, how do we know who is what? Well, you know, many of us, we've done our genealogy. We know where our people uh, come from. I, kn I know that my people were slaves in Alabama. We even recently tracked down the family that owned them. Right. Um, um, not only that, they always ask, how much are, how are they supposed to get? Um, and then what are y'all going to do with it when you get it? Um, black people ain't gonna do nothing but buy this or buy that. Dude, first of all, it's a debt that's owed, and if you owe me money, you don't get to dictate to me what I do with my money that you owe me. You know, if I want to flush it down the toilet, that's my business. That it that ain't your business. What we gonna do with the money? The other thing is, they seem to figure out how much to give other groups. You know, when when Japanese were interred during World War II, somebody came up with the formula to say, "Let's give them twenty thousand dollars each." That's right. And they That's gave right. and they gave all of the you know living survivors who who had been interred, they gave them twenty thousand dollar checks. They didn't ask them what y'all gonna do with it. You gonna go on vacation? Nothing. But whenever it comes to black people, we get these superficial questions, all of these excuses um, about what we're gonna do with it. That's on the reparations piece. But then when we talk about uh, 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 basic legislation and resources set aside to mitigate the extrajudicial murder, brutalization, um, and all the disparities that exist in American society toward black people, they can't figure out how to do that. Like you said, it's always, well, this is going to help black folk too. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Y'all are going to benefit from this as well. But yet they can specifically deal with uh, immigrants. They can specifically do DACA. They can specifically um, do something for the LGBT community, specifically for the transgender community, specifically for Asian American and Pacific Islander. But then when it comes to black folk, uh, no, we, we can't do anything. That, when, they, when they talked about the Tulsa race massacre, it came out that the Biden administration said no, it didn't want to say anything about reparations before the Tulsa race massacre. And 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 so I'm, I'm wondering what is up with the Democratic Party when you want to tell black people gear up for the 2022 election. But here we are halfway through 2021 and you figured out a way to do something for everybody else and you keep telling us to wait. That's insane to me. Let's take this phone call and then I'll get your thoughts on that. Good morning. Good morning, Bishop. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? One thing that I did hear that President Biden said when he got elected, he said he going to make sure he take care of African American people. Now it's saying like he done the opposite. He sure did for the age and everything else. Like they said, what about the black people? I agree, uh, Tesla. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean but Biden, Biden said, quote, quote you, know, this you know, this is important, important that, that we, you know, the old blues song they used to say, put it on paper. It's important, it's important that, we that we remember that Joe Biden, Biden is, the only is the only president, Bishop, that said, that said quote, quote I, owe I owe you black people. people. I know I that I got here because, because of you. That's what he said. So this, so this, President Obama didn't even say that. President Clinton. 
didn't even, didn't say, even that. say that. <laughs> Joe Biden said, I owe you black folks. So, so I have, I have to, ask, to ask, what are, what are black people doing, doing about it? You know, you know, at some point we have to start asking the, 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 the spouses, spouses, the spouses being abused. When, when are we going to decide to do something different? Are we, are we going to continue kicking the can down the road and talk about what such and such husband's going up the street and how such and such is not taking care of her kids? When are we going to deal with our own house? Look at Joe Manchin and, and what he's doing. Look, Look at how he's, you know, you know slapping, slapping the Democrat Party around, pushing, pushing Joe Biden around. around. The question must be asked. When, when are, are we, we going to do something about it? We, we, we have the, the, we, we love talking about what Republicans are not doing, what, what Trump was, was doing, doing, you know, what, what the, the good things that Joe Biden is doing. doing. But, but I, I really, really want to ask us, what are we going to do, black folks? It's In 2022, what are we going to do? Are we going to start challenging some of these folks, primarying some of these folks? Mm. Is there, there going to be a consequence? For what, for what they don't, they don't do. do. When you mentioned the Japanese, I just want to remind everybody, that was in 1989 mm -hmm. under the Reagan administration. Mm -hmm. So Republicans found a way to give to, to, the, give to the Japanese. Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders you voted on it. Where's Bernie Sanders? Where's these 20-plus right. candidates? And I'm saying, and I'm saying this as the former 2016 racial justice director for Bernie Sanders. And I'm asking, as a former staffer, where are you, Bernie Sanders? I thought you said you marched with King. What happened? What happened? I'm, I'm trying to figure out where, where is it. Let's go, Let's go down the list. Where's Senator Warren? Where's Amy, Where's Amy Klobuchar? Where have, where have all these folks that claim to have our back? Beto? I'm looking, I'm looking for Beto. Beto. Where's Beto? Mm. He, Beto said he support reparations. This this a massive thing. The reason why I keep going back to that is because, is because it, is a it is a perfect example of showing, of showing why, why there is a study, study for reparations. reparations. Why? why? Because they because don't want to do it. Right. Because if you didn't do it, they said that the Tulsa Massacre, uh, uh, I believe somewhere between 300 and 600 people that were murdered. Yes. So we're not even talking about, you know, millions of people. This is a very small group that you could just earmark some money for. Mm -hmm. You could just call your son, Joe Biden, who's making millions of dollars sitting on the board that we're confused about. You could just call 10 millionaires and say, hey, how can we put a little bit of five on it just to give them something on the private sector? Shout out to attorney Demario Simmons, my gladiator and colleague you know, that I've worked with on many cases. His organization gave the limit to buy for three hundred thousand dollars from the private sector mm. you know you know and people say well that's, that's not enough well it was never their responsibility to do right <laughs> non if i give you something on oh, christmas you don't tell me it's not my responsibility no what you should it's, it's not enough. enough what you do is ask your mama why your mama didn't put nothing under the tree mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so, so this is if the private sector vision can figure it out i'm trying to figure out why, Why is the government not? We, you, we, and you and I know the I answer. Want, I just want to ask you, what are they going to do about it? Right, right. And, I, and, and, I, and this is not me don't saying don't vote, vote because they love saying we, we still, we, we still got. This is not what this what I'm saying because we have because ballot we have down, down, down races. We have races that are important. You know, the people, you know, the people need to be involved in. I just want to know, like the Hispanic community, like your other call about the Hispanic community. The Hispanic community votes fifty fifty on each side, even if they don't even have those beliefs. Because I don't believe that ten percent have conservative values and fifty percent have liberal values. But they vote in a way that makes both parties adjust to their demands. And we, and we saw that, that with Florida, with Florida, well, Florida, Florida, Florida has had a Latino community going for Trump and, and California going for Bernie Sanders, going for Biden. So they, so they figured out a way to be strategic in their voting, in their voting and their leverage. And as, and as a result, they get something from it. So I just want to know, when are we going to get to that point? Yeah, and you know, here's the other thing. They can figure out a way to do something for folks that weren't even aggrieved by America. Um, under the Obama administration, they set aside monies for Holocaust survivors. You know, and, and in case people don't know the history, the Holocaust happened in Germany. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, America was not responsible for that. Yet the American government under a black president set aside monies for Holocaust survivors. And his vice president, who is now president, can't set aside monies for the families of three survivors of the Tulsa race massacre. After uh, Trump was elected in 2016, the Democrats told us, listen, uh, give us back the, the House um, uh, and the Senate in 2018, uh, and we'll be able to challenge Trump. We'll be able to push an agenda. Um, we gave them the House. 
uh, in 2018. Did nothing for black people. Um, in 2020, we gave them all three branches of government. And yet, six months into an administration that uh, it, where their party runs the House, the Senate, and the executive branch, we're still begging and asking them, what are y'all going to do for black people? That's insane. Um, the vote, they're talking about voter suppression, yet the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013. What are Democrats doing to restore the Voting Rights Act? The reason why all this crazy stuff is happening, the, the, the laws that were passed in Georgia and other places, there's no preclearance anymore. The federal government cannot come into jurisdictions. Um, um, they don't have to get their permission anymore before they make drastic changes to voting rights because the Voting Rights Act is just that on paper. There is no enforcement of it. What is the strategy, Democrats, to restore the Voting Rights Act? It's just so much that's just hanging in the balance, and yet they continue to, like you say, kick the can down the road, tell us, just wait, just hold on, just give us 2022, and we'll do something about it. We heard that in 18, we heard that in 20, and there's a lot of black folk that ain't feeling, okay, give, you know, put keep y'all in power in 2022, and y'all will get to us. We're saying, no, you're not going to get to us after you got to everybody else, and there are those who will espouse, don't vote. I don't espouse, don't vote. But at the same time, I understand those who do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, we, the, and we have to certainly do something different. Uh, uh, and, and I don't say, you know, don't vote. I empower people to vote your conscience. Uh, but I do want to point out that next year in 2022, uh, there are 30 states that will have the attorney general you know, on the ballot. And those are very important, you know, uh, races that we can look at. I've identified actually 11 of those states that are very vulnerable. So what I've had to do, Bishop, just because there's been so much disappointment in the movement, uh, not even just with reparations, but when we look at the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, you know, them trying to gut that out, take away a qualified immunity, and now switch up the messaging in the fourth quarter. So, you know, it's not that important, you know, and then to do what they did for the Asian Americans, to, uh, and, then uh, and then now to further slap us once again, you know, with the Tulsa so Massacre, myself, I said, let me try to come up with some type of voter information campaign, either myself, because what I do, the Lord, the Lord called me to do this work, so I, I'm forced in it, so I try to do something that I can hold on to to just motivate me to keep going, you know, so I said, let me start a campaign called 3030, and it's just nonpartisan, it's voter information, and it's just getting, you know, getting the information out so that we organize in our communities to understand, you know, that these attorney general seats are coming up, and we can see with Keith Ellison how important it is, and I was not always a fan of Keith Ellison, by the way. But I'm, but I'm very impressed with how he did manage his case. But I'm also astute enough to know it was because all eyes were watching this case. Um, you don't normally have an opportunity to bring in special prosecutors and you don't have the budget that they did. But it's important that we understand, if, uh, you know, that these attorney general states are coming up. And Keith Ellison's race is one. So my advocacy is actually up for re-election. My advocacy on that is not about, you know, supporting candidates or endorsing candidates or getting behind candidates. It's just really trying to focus on these ballot, uh, ballot down races of uh, issues so that folks can know, you know, what's on the ballot. I trained about 200 people on Tuesday, I mean, like Saturday yesterday, uh, of just folks who want to know, do you want to be a candidate, an operative, or do you want to be a grassroots organizer? Because just myself, I want to put a drop in the bucket to know that I'm doing something. Yeah. And so I, I hope that, you know, all of us, especially those of us with a microphone, will figure out some type of solution, you know, that it may not be a cure-all, but the reality is we cannot, we are going to be further disappointed uh, with this administration. And it's our job to call it out. I told my client yesterday, he said, well, you know, Ted, we want to give him credit where it's due. I said, well, it's enough of y'all doing that. It's only a, a few hand, a handful of us that are willing to publicly call out this administration. I'm a contributor on BNC. And it's only a handful when you look at BNC, uh, Fox News, MSNBC, CNN. We have all of your additional black media like what you're doing. But I'm talking about on the major cable networks. It's only a handful of us, and I know you appear on BNC also, uh, that are willing to call out this administration. So we have to do everything we can you know, to continue to call folks out. And as a result, I get trolls, all of my comments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know you do. You're the best, you're the best bitch for that <laughs>
<laughs> they come, they come. Listen, let me ask you this. What are we going to do about the, 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 the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus? There are many who say, you know, they've outlived any level of usefulness. Uh, and when you see some of the things that they're doing, uh, some of the compromises they are making, um, many times it seems like what they're doing is mo is mostly symbol and not substance. I don't care about nobody wearing kitty cloth and, and all that kind of stuff um, if you can't move the needle for black people. And then when you see people like Uncle James Clyburn, um, you know, start waffling, uh, you know, when... When when Biden won, somebody asked him, you know, you kind of set this in motion with pushing black people in South Carolina to vote for Biden. And when he won South Carolina, it kind of turned the tide of the primary. What do you want from Joe Biden and his administration? Clyburn said nothing. Um, insane. Um, and, and, and then um, Clyburn comes out after I expected Tim Scott to say something stupid like America's not a racist country. Uh, uh, on the heels of Tim Scott saying it, Kamala Harris came out and said it. Joe Biden came out and said it. And then Jim Clyburn came out and said, America's not a racist country. Basically, there's pockets of racism by individuals and entities as if racism is not systemic. And then he had the audacity uh, to waffle on the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act uh, saying, you know, uh, I don't need a perfect bill. Um, so he, he's willing to throw out qualified immunity for some watered down version of it. Then they go down to Tulsa and they start doing a hold down and, and, and dancing around and all that kind of stuff. What are we going to do with the CBC? <laughs> well, you're, well, right, you're right on, on, all, on all of those folks that, folks that came out about the racist country, country, and I just want to be clear on the order of who said who first. first. It, was it was actually Jim Clyburn that said something before Kamala Harris. Okay. And the reason why I'm pointing that out is because, because we led the way. He was, he was the first, first one that went out and said, because I want people to think about the order and how it went out and why it's so important. He, he, not, he, he absolutely turned, turned the tide in the election. election. You, you know, when he went out in South Carolina and said, Joe knows us and we know Joe. And then after that, and I want people to understand that Jim Clyburn is the most powerful black elected official in Congress, period. Mm -hmm. He's the whip. A lot of folks don't understand, like, the power that comes in. In 2010, I went to a CBC political training, and one of the things we did was went and sat at his table. It's the longest table that I've ever seen, and he was at the front of it. And it showed me the visual of the power that this man has. Met him that day. He was the whip then in 2010. And he comes off as this, you know, good old country boy that's just trying to do the right thing, and that to, to, to most folks they don't understand the power that he had because not only, not only did he get himself out of joe biden, biden he picked up the phone, up the phone and, organized and organized all over this country so that they would so coalesce, coalesce and get behind joe biden, biden. people think people that, he's that he's just a regular congressman no he's not he has power all over this country so when he, so when he ran, ran out just like he just get joe biden elected he ran out first to say no 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 i agree with tim scott and that, and that made it easy for Vice, for Vice President Harris, Harris to come out and follow the lead and so, and so on. Because, because so he's, he's been the political football, football if you will, or the, or the, 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 the test, test to, 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 go to go out and say, okay, okay if Jim, Jim says it, it then it must, then be, it must be all right with black people. And he's done, and he's done that, that repeatedly. repeatedly. And it's not, and it's that, not that he hasn't done good things. I tell people all the time, if you've been in Congress any length of amount of time, you've done something good by default. You know, you signed something or sponsored or co-sponsored by default, at least, at best. The question is, when is the CBC taking leadership on not just introducing these bills, but making, but making sure, sure that we're calling out those that are blocking us behind. And so the answer is, I think these folks need to start being primary. I think, I think that they need to get, I told in my training, running, running is not always about winning. It's, it's also, also about organizing folks around your ideas and making, and making sure that that, that elected official is held accountable. And it's much easier to do, Bishop, on the congressional level. When, when people actually look at these races, and this is why I spent so much time training, when you actually look at the races and realize only 20, 30,000 people went to the poll in a lot of these races, and that's in the 2020, Trump, Trump is, we better get Trump out or it's going to be a Holocaust. When you break down these small divisions, 
uh, uh, districts. It is, it is a very, very small, small amount of people, so it doesn't require as much to win as people think. And it certainly doesn't, doesn't require a, a, a lot to be able to challenge them and give them a lot of their money to say, you know what, 5,000 people are behind me, elected member so-and-so, Bit Clyburn or whoever it is, and we're, and we're demanding that you speak up for us, or we're going to primary you again in two years, because Congress, Congress runs every two years, until, until you get it. And I tell, and I tell people, the only thing that politicians fear is losing their power and their seat. It. And so, and so that, that's my suggestion. We just have to start primary folks, Bishop, and, and take the heat for doing so. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time. Um, and... Um, uh, so I've got to transition out, but it's always a pleasure talking to you, uh, yes. having you on. And um, at, at some point, we'll be off of this platform where, where we can get the real, <laughs> the raw and uncut uh, <laughs> version. <laughs> I did good, bitch. You did. I, you did. You did. I appreciate it. All right, my sister. We'll see you soon. Right, thank you so much. Take care. All right, I got a transition off of um, WTCC uh, for 10 o'clock. Listen, if you're looking for a place to worship, check us out at the Spring of Hope Church of God in Christ, 35 Alden Street, Sunday morning at 11 a.m. We are in the sanctuary for those who continue to inquire, are we open to the public? Yes, we are. Uh, we are requiring sanitizing, mask wearing, temperatures, and social distancing. Uh, but we are open, uh, so you are more than welcome to come and to worship with us. Remember, on Wednesday at 11 a.m., we will be at City Hall um, supporting the Mass Senior Action Council, calling for the removal of Grand Wizard uh, Cheryl Claprud, uh, the police commissioner. Um, we need to pressure this mayor uh, to get rid of her at all costs. All right. Uh, we'll go on for maybe another 10 minutes after the hour, after we sign off of WTCC. Um, I solicit your prayers for the family of Tommy Lee Thomas, uh, who passed away. I will be preaching her funeral um, later on this morning. Um, so um, please remember to keep uh, her family in your prayers. All right. Uh, so until the next time I talk to you and you talk to me, always remember god loves you and so do i we'll be right back
All right, all right, all right, all right. Listen, I got to move expeditiously. A um, lot to do on this day. Um, but I want to encourage you all, you know, to do something. You know, as Teslin said, what are you going to do about it? When we talk about um, all of these various issues and things that are happening in our community, it's not just uh, a, a venting session. It is about venting because we need to. That's therapeutic for us. And, and, you know, oftentimes people have asked me, well, what good is it for you to just talk about the problems and blah, blah, blah? We need to vent. Black people need an outlet. With everything that we go through in this nation, um, we deserve the opportunity to vent about uh, the disparities we face, the brutality we have to deal with, um, white supremacy and racism. Um, that, that we have to live with on a day-by-day -day basis. And so any outlet um, that provides us an opportunity to vent is good for our mental health. So we, so we, we try to provide that. Um, but then at the end of the day, uh, we've got to do something about it. So we need you to speak up, speak out, um, uh, organize, um, run for office, or support a candidate that is running for office. We've got some dynamic candidates that are running for office, even in our local races. Um, Ayanna Crawford is running for the school committee. Zaida Govan is running um, uh, for the city council. And there are others that are out there. Janae McDonald, uh, Marlo Brown's running for re-election. Uh, um, you know, we've, we've got black uh, candidates um, that are running for office. Latino candidates that are running for office um, that are trying to move and shake um, the system. Um, and, and, and that's all a good thing. And those of you who, who don't feel that that's your forte to run, you can support, you can organize with, you can donate money. You, there's a number of things that you can do um, as well. And when it comes to the quality of life in our city, we've got to speak up. Um, this police commissioner needs to go. And we need you to to support that effort. Now, think about it for a moment. Let me underscore it again for you. Okay. Um, the Springfield Police Department has been labeled one of the worst in the nation. The Department of Justice has determined that it regularly, regularly engages in excessive force and brutality against black and brown residents okay they are under negotiations with the department of justice right now to mitigate the civil rights violations against black and brown people right now as we speak okay as we speak right now over 15 officers are being prosecuted for felonies for brutalizing black people, for perjury, lying, trying to cover up crimes against black people, for threatening to murder a Latino, um, for brutalizing black boys in school. This is happening right now as we speak. And in the middle of all that, this lady says in public forums, we don't have a problem with systemic racism. Even if she felt that, because most racists don't think they're racist. Why the hell would she express that publicly? And why the hell would the mayor allow it to be expressed publicly? After she said it in that Zoom forum that he had, a, a serious conversation should have went on after that to say, don't you ever say anything that crazy in public again. Obviously, that conversation never took place because not only did she say it, she put it in writing. She wrote this, put it in a letter to the Mass Senior Action Council. You got to read the letter. The letter is insane. <laughs> I mean, and, and, and here's the thing. I'm not surprised at what racists do, and it really not, you know, but but even even for some racists, sometimes 
they can surprise you not necessarily because they do something racist but because of the stupidity with which they do it and I, I i would fully expect for her to say some outlandish stuff like this you know with her clan buddies you know with with her fellow cops behind the scenes somewhere but to be the sitting police commissioner and to literally put this in writing in writing okay let me, let me <laughs> she says she says my department is not racist nor do we suffer from systemic racism as we save many lives weekly my department is not implicitly biased we are caring intelligent and sensitive individuals from the community of a multitude of backgrounds okay i do not i am not exerting any privilege as was suggested wait a minute she says my rank was obtained through hard work dedication and many stressful sleepless nights you are a privileged white woman let's just keep it a buck you're a privileged white woman who had who has multiple disciplinary actions on your record has cost the city hundreds of thousands of dollars in lawsuits when when you kick a man in his testicle so hard he has to have reconstructive surgery that's Cheryl Claproot personally okay you've been convicted of perjury and filing a false police report yes the sitting police commissioner is a Brady cop convicted and yet you rose to become the police commissioner, tell me a black person could have cost the city hundreds of thousands of dollars, been convicted of perjury, and filing a false police report, and still became commissioner. Yes, commissioner, you do exert privilege. The fact that you wrote that crazy letter is the epitome of white privilege. To tell black seniors who have experienced racism their whole life who have seen firsthand the brutality of this police department and you got to call Cassidy to write them that letter that's the epitome of white privilege every time you get in your car and drive to Springfield from Wilbraham and go down to that police station and sit in your office and make your upper six-figure salary despite what's on your record you're exerting privilege <laughs> I mean it is insane um, <laughs> I mean that letter is absolutely insane um, but she thinks she can do that. that. I mean, that's the epitome of white privilege. Yeah, I'm going to tell these niggas off. I'm gonna you, that's basically what she's saying. I'm, I'm going to get these niggas told. That's what that, that's the tone of that letter. That The tone of that letter is how dare you niggas, you know, come at me like this. Let me tell you something. And we're not on WTCC anymore. We're just straight on the internet, so I can just keep it a buck. The tone of Commissioner Clapwood's letter is, I'm going to tell you niggas what's up. Okay? And then for you black people backing her, shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. For y'all who think, um, you know, I had somebody um, 
somebody black who said uh, on social media uh, the other day, oh, I can only take Bishop Swan in small doses. He's a, he, he be out of pocket. Well, you know, and, and, and so I said to him, I said, you know, bless you, son. I said, thank God Jesus was out of pocket. And thank God Martin Luther King was out of pocket and Nat Turner and Denmark VC. And thank God Harriet Tubman was out of pocket because your black behind wouldn't have the privileges that you have right now if it wasn't for black folk being out of pocket. Okay. So for the y'all who think I'm out of pocket, you better praise God that there are people who are out of pocket enough to challenge this racist system while you go along to get along. But that's what this that's what this grand wizard um, police commissioner from Wilbraham is, is basically doing is she telling the niggas off. The old niggas too. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm just talking from the tone of her letter. How dare y'all say I'm exerting privilege. I worked hard. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Unlike you lazy niggas. That, that's what she's. This, this, is what, this is what's unspoken in the letter. This ain't about systemic. Like she said to me. In writing. We don't have a problem with police brutality. We got a problem with with little black niggas uh, in gangs. This is your police commissioner. And I know somebody's going to say I'm being unfair. I'm saying she didn't say nigga. That's what she said. Without saying it. She said it without saying it. That letter is egregious. It's disgusting. It's disrespectful. It's unprofessional. And she needs to go. And you need to be down at City Hall at 11 o'clock on Wednesday demanding that the mayor get rid of this Klan's woman as our commissioner. Somebody said, well, Bishop Swan just mad they removed him as a chaplain because he didn't go to meetings. Eh, lies. Lies. Let's set the record straight. Chaplains meetings and NAACP meetings were at the same time. I'm the president of the NAACP. It was understood when I became a chaplain. I would not be able to regularly attend meetings because of that conflict. But I would get the information I needed from the lead chaplain, Gail Hill. Reverend Hill knows this. Reverend Hill knows this. And yet, when, when the spokesperson for the police department tried to lie on me and label me, oh, he didn't come to meetings in three years. Reverend Hill was silent. She was silent. She didn't say, Reverend Hill, why didn't you come out and and publicly say, no, that's not the truth. I knew Bishop Swan had a scheduling conflict. It was understood. There was an arrangement. There was an agreement about his attending meetings. Why didn't you say that, Reverend Hill? See, that's my problem. When black people allow this system to disparage and castigate other black people and because we want to remain in the good graces of massa we sit back in the cut and watch them lynch brutalize castigate and disparage other black people shame on reverend hill for not speaking out when they lied on me about that whole chaplaincy thing. Yes, I said it. I don't care if you go and show her the video or anything like that. I called her immediately. When they ran that, we're not going to renew our relationship with you. She said, I, let me get back to you. Never called back. Never had a conversation with her since. So, yes, I'm calling her out today. She should have spoken up. I thought we were friends. I thought we were brother and sister. I would have never, never, I would have never allowed them to do that to her. I would have never 
known the truth about the situation and allowed them to publicly disparage her name without speaking up and telling them, no, that's a lie. I would have never let that happen. Because remaining in the good graces of Massa was not that important to me that I would let them disparage my sister like that. So no, this ain't about I'm upset because they removed me as a chaplain. Y'all know better than that. I've been speaking out against this rogue police department for 30 years. The whole time I was a chaplain, I've been speaking out against the corruption in this department. So that ain't got nothing to do with this. It's got to do with the fact that my children live in this city. My grandchildren live in this city. That, that black and brown people ought to be treated with dignity. And fairly. And we don't have to live under the tyranny of this department. And we deserve to have a head of, a de of the department that is not some old time rogue washed up cop who spent her time on the street brutalizing people lying on police reports and now is sitting back in the cut talking about ain't no racism all right i gotta <laughs> i gotta I, I gotta go do a funeral y'all so i gotta i gotta get out the way um um, I got to get out the way. I got to move on. <laughs> My wife is texting me. She said, uh, uh, I guess I'm going, I'm going too far. Uh, but Hey, you know, I said what I said and it is what it is. Um, so listen, Wednesday at, um, Wednesday at, uh, 11 a.m. at City Hall, uh, 36 Court Street, Springfield. I need y'all to be there, All right? We're standing with Mass Senior Action Council. Uh, we're calling for the removal of this police commissioner. Um, calling for a nationwide search. And we're also calling for the mayor to comply with the uh, ruling of a Superior Court judge, Hamden County Superior Court judge, who said um, that uh, he needs to appoint a five-member police commission um, as passed by the city council. Uh, we need police reform in this city, and we don't need smoke and mirrors. We don't need pretend police reform. We don't need Judge Ireland's face to pretend that you're doing the right thing. We need you to actually do the right thing. All right. I got to get out the way until the next time I talk to you and you talk to me. Always remember, God loves you. And so do I. I'm out. Peace.